I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, am I on? Yeah, I think I am. I'd like to welcome everyone to this systematic theology discussion, the topic being our Creator God. I'd like to start off with two foundational texts that we're going to look at today in our understanding of this God who is active in His creation, a God who made us with purpose, a God who made us by design, a God who has to sound like a fortune cookie, a plan for each and every one of us. A God who is not far from us, he is not a deistic God, he does not stand back and let us just do our own thing, completely uh, void of relationship and intelligence into what we are doing right now. This is a God who is with us even as we speak. He is a God who has created each and every single human being here. The first verse I'd like to read to you is one that we all know, I'm sure that we all know, but one that you can never get tired of going back to again and again and again. And that is Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me uh, read our second foundational text. It is from Psalm 115. Turn there with me, if you will. Psalm 115, verses 4 through 8, with special emphasis on verse 8. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak, eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear, noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Here's verse 8, the one I want to pay close attention to today. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Now first, I want to address Genesis 1.1 and start off with this. In our understanding of systematic theology, if you do not have a creator God who is active in the creation that he has made, but kind of stands back and lets it all happen, lets you in your sin, lets the, courses of, uh, lets the course of history go without active involvement, you are not going to understand the rest of the Bible. The Bible does not start off with John 3.16 for a reason, because John 3.16 does not make sense unless you understand Genesis 1.1. For God so loved the world, what's that? What's that? What's the world? How do we know what the world is without Genesis 1-1? Have you watched the Marvel movies late, lately? There's millions of them. Which one are you talking about? Are you talking about the alternate reality one? What are we, what are we at, 616? That's, that's, our, that's our reality, and there's like a, bunch, a whole bunch of other ones? If we don't have Genesis 1-1, then that's absolutely a possibility. Maybe God just died for the one in universe 616, and the rest don't have a savior named Jesus Christ. In 1962, the American education, education system officially kicked God out of the schools when they said no prayers allowed, no public prayer allowed, especially with the emphasis being on led by the staff or faculty at the school. Now, you can do it if you want, just like, you know, you can go play marbles if you want. We're just not going to do that here because, you know, school is for serious people who want to learn, and God has no place here. It reminds me of a, a quote from uh, a TV show I watch. The protagonist or anti-hero tells one of the people of his staff and says, this is an environment of welcoming, and you should just get the heck out of here. It's a contradictory statement. This is a place of learning, and so God, therefore, must not be here. He's not welcome here. It's a contradictory statement, and it is a direct attack on education because the fear of the Lord 
is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. And, as it says in Thessalonians, all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, all of them, not just some of them, all of them, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Hidden. They need to be found out. I once heard a man describe, uh, it was supposed to be as a joke, uh, but it actually has a lot more application than he thinks. A man described life as a video game. When you're born, you're at level one. And he, uh, you know, when you die, you're at level 99 or whatever. And he said that there are some places in the earth that you can't get to unless you're at a high level. It's very similar to our experience in the world. There are some things that we can't understand unless we sought them out in Christ. But as new babes and infants, we can't fully understand them. They must be hidden. They must be found out because they are hidden in Christ. It is a glory to search those things out. So when the schools kicked out God in 1962, exactly 60 years later, we have a documentary by Matt Walsh, who is a conservative personality and uh, blogger and author. And the name of the documentary is called, What is a Woman? See you, God. We got no place for you here. We're about education. 60 years later, we don't even know what a woman is. Going great. Things are going well. Success. Success. Reminds me of the Three Stooges after they sabotaged it, completely destroyed the machine, but they said they shook each other. Success. Success. We bring the whole thing down. And, and, and I submit to you that they probably had a higher education standard than, than most of our teachers today, and I'm not even joking about that. They could probably tell you what a woman is. There is an organization out there that the, 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 more, the more time goes on, the more we progress down this crazy rabbit hole of just make everything up, the political correctness, silliness, the Black Lives Matter, foolishness, the COVID conspiracy nonsense, and the globalization and all the silliness that comes along with that, this organization's name, it's just making more and more sense as time goes on. It's just, it, it, it just comes, it's just making more and more sense. And I want to shake his, his hand, whoever came up with it. And I know who came up with it because his name is Ken Ham. And the name of his organization is Answers in Genesis. He is, he is, he is attacked so horribly by even members of our own community. Because he, will, he, he stands on that, on, on there, and he's not even about the gospel. What does Genesis have to do with the gospel? You know, right here preaching John 3.16, and there's Ken Ham standing on this little pedestal, and it's called Genesis 1.1, and he just won't get off for any reason. He's just not leaving that pedestal. Bless his heart. Thank you, Lord, for Ken Ham. And the longer he stands on there, the longer you see why he's standing on there. Because we don't know what a woman is. And he has an organization called Answers in Genesis. Did you know that once we've surrendered, it's the, 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 what, the answer to what is a woman is not found only in your biology. That's not the only place it's found. The, the reason we're questioning the biology is because we've already given up the purpose. We have given up the purpose of a woman. And next, the, the biology is next. We have surrendered the idea that men and women are supposed to take dominion as families over this earth, be fruitful, multiply, and take dominion over the earth. We've surrendered that idea, especially in our institutions. We don't even know the purpose. We don't even know why we're here. Is it any surprise that biology gets attacked next? Is it any surprise that the reason we know what a woman is biologically is because we first know what man and woman's purpose on this earth is initially? We've surrendered the purpose of men and women here on this earth, and it's no surprise to anyone should come. It's no surprise that we're going to surrender the biology next. 
We didn't get the biology and say, okay, okay, you, you have these organs and you have ego's organs. Okay, blah, blah, one, two. Okay, I got it now. I know what we're supposed to do. Nope. It started off with, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Take dominion over the earth. And then we figured out the biology. We serve a creator God who's actively involved with his creation. It's, it's so profound. The involvement with his creation is so profound that a lot of people don't see this. My dad pointed this out to me once. He's so involved with what we're doing. And the, the, the idea of, of, of pietism in our culture is, is substantial. That we just, we're just strangers and passing through. I just want to get out of here and go to heaven. But my dad said to me once, he said, you know, almost every time you get a peek of heaven, what are they all talking about? They're all talking about what's going on down here. Almost every single time. They're talking about human beings doing stuff on the earth. Very rarely do they talk about stuff going on in heaven. They're talking about what are these human beings doing and how are we going to thwart them or, or support them. So the next time you think about, oh, I just want to get out of here. Think about, you know, they're probably talking about you up there. He is the Lord of hosts, and he's the only one who can make that claim. He's got a host of people actively involved with what's going on down here. He is a creator God who's actively involved with his creation all of the time. It's so substantial. Hebrews chapter 1, if you turn with me there. This is the only place that says this, but I'll use this as an example. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Here's the, ver here's the part of the verse I want to pay attention to. And he upholds the universe by the word of his actively upholding the universe by the word of his power. Not an atlas. Ugh, so difficult. Oh, punishment. God loves his creation. He's actively involved in it. Here's Jesus Christ. He upholds a universe among many, right? We're just 616. We're just another one, man. We're just another among the many. Dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the wind. That, that's just, I mean, that, this whole multi, multiverse thing, this whole, whole multi-universe thing, that's just another way of saying dust in the wind. Hey, in this universe, maybe it's wrong to commit adultery, but maybe it's not in universe 617. So what difference does it make? Hey, when you die, nothing happens. We worship the creator God who is actively involved in his creation, who loves his creation, called everything good. And we, ha we have a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. An active God who's with us in this room right now. The reason I'm emphasizing these things is because I'm going to read to you some creation myths from other cultures. And these creation myths sacrifice one of three things every single time. They sacrifice the purpose of mankind. They sacrifice the relevance of the story. And they sacrifice the practicality of what do we do now. Not practical. Let me read to you some of these stories. Sixteen incredible creation stories from around the world. Of course, they put the Judeo-Christian one in there. Let me just say something really quick about the Judeo-Christian. I gave up that term a long time ago because the Jews do not believe as we do. They do not. We have an active God, a creator God, who has a son named Jesus Christ. And if you were a true Jew, then you'd be a Christian. But Jesus Christ himself says... You, don't, you guys 
to the Pharisees and the Jews, you don't believe in me because you don't even believe the Old Testament. I read a book recently by a man named uh, Alfred Edersheim, who was a uh, 19th century super scholar and uh, Hebrew historian. And I, think he, I think he actually think he was a Jew, uh, ethnic Jew. He said, you know, uh, you know, I'm studying these things and I'm studying what the, the Hebrews did, the sacrifices, the, the uh, festivals, um, the clothing. And it's, it's a great book about, te- and, and he separates the, the tradition from the actual command. Here's what God said. Here's what they did. And you can, after reading that book, you can easily, easily understand why they made so many laws around the actual law. It's very understandable because if you made a mistake, you could really send the whole nation into destruction real fast. So I get it. I understand. It's like safety laws, but then, you know, you just keep building on them, and then, then you're into, if you take so many steps on the Sabbath, you're in sin. Alfred Edersheim made the comment, and he said, it's just, he said to the reader, you know, you know the Jews don't believe this, Right? You know, the, 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 the Jewish people of our day and age, they don't, the, the reason that they explain this stuff away is because they don't believe it. It's the foundation for their faith, but they don't believe it. That's why they have the Talmud, to explain it all away. All of it? No. But it's a convenient out for actually believing that if a man lays with another man as with a woman, he should be put to death. Convenient out. Well, not really. Not exactly. If you were a true Jew, you would believe in Jesus Christ and no longer be a Jew. That's, what, that's not my words. It's what Christ said. The reason that the Jewish people of our day and age don't believe in Jesus is because they actually don't believe in the Old Testament. They don't believe it. They have extra biblical writings. That's what they believe. Yeah, I reference it a little bit over here. But it's kind of similar to the Mormons. It's actually kind of all about the Book of Mormon. That's what it's really all about. Yeah, the Bible is good, but it's all about the Book of Mormon. It's the same with the Jews. They don't believe the Old Testament. We've got Jew, Jew, uh, Christians all over. Oh, Judeo-Christian. No, 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 no. Christian. I believe at, at some level, if I, if I do use that term, this is, I'm talking about myself now, and I understand why people say Judeo-Christian, but I'm at the point where if I would say Judeo-Christian, I'd be insulting Christ. Christian. Christ said, if you believe the Old Testament, you'd believe in me. One goes right with the other. It's just like that. They mesh. You cannot believe in the Old Testament and reject Christ at the same time. It's impossible. Let's read some creation myths from around the world, shall we? Some of these have some difficult names that I'm not going to try and pronounce, so let's start with the Native Americans. Native Americans told tales of a raven accidentally creating man from a pea pot. Raven stumbles upon a fully grown man. Curious and confused, the raven goes on to question him. The man explains that for, that for four days he grew inside of a pea pot. On the fifth day, he emerged fully formed. When he emerged, he had a pain in his stomach Alongside him were pools of water, and when he drank from them, the pain in his stomach stopped. The raven examined the man and then himself. The raven lifted off his mask. He stared up and down at the man and all of their similarities until the raven finally spoke. What are you? From where did you come? I have never seen anything like you. Raven had realized, and notice it's, it's uh, raven is the proper name there. It's not the raven, it's raven. Had realized man shared the same form as himself. Man shared that he had been born from a pea pod. The raven explained to the man that he had made the vine but did not realize anything would be born from it. Raven asked the man to wait for him and he flew away. Raven returned with berries, handed them to the man. Here is what I have made for you to eat. I also wish them to be plentiful over the earth. Now eat them. Raven then led man to a small creek. Raven gathered clay and began to form small objects. Raven flapped his wings over the object four times and brought them to life. No active involvement here by any sort of creator. Kind of an accident, cosmic accident. There we give up the purpose of mankind. Okay, so man's here now. What? What's in between me and the raven? Did we get here? Are we alive today because we're all the same as animals?
Are, are, are we walking around right now because a fruit fly has the same objective value as I do? I submit to you, no. It doesn't. And a surrendering of Genesis 1-1 will yield, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Maybe we do have the same relevance as a fruit fly. What's the difference? I remember a couple of years ago, I was talking to some high school students at a youth group, and I asked them, uh, what was wrong with killing a baby? I might have told this story here before, but I'm going to pay special attention to a question that was asked. And uh, one of them, and I'm, again, most of them American public school education. And when I asked them what's wrong with killing a baby, none of them said, and they all go to church. None of them said, Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. Not one of them. Eventually they got there, but after giving some other excuses, like, well, it's hurting someone, or, you know, that kind of a thing. One of the questions they said was, they raised their hand, I said yes, and he said, well, um, they didn't do anything to you, so you can't hurt them. And I said, have you ever eaten a chicken? Yes. What did he ever do to you? And I could tell that the kid had never thought about it before. And why would he? He goes to public school. Why would he do that? They don't, we don't ask those kind of questions in there. We don't talk about serious things. We just talk about what's two plus two. And that's on its way out the door, too. That's borderline racist now to say that. Common core. That's common. All common and no core. Let's read another creation myth. For Hindus, there is no one story of creation, but multiple creation theories that tell of a cyclic creation and destruction. The story of Vishnu is one creation story. And this is uh, a brief note on this. I might have talked about this before too, but cyclic, circle, big circle. Everything goes in a circle, yin and yang, good and evil. It's all the same. Do you know that has a profound effect on your understanding of technology? If you don't view time as linear, as a beginning and an end, and there's a difference, and you can tell the difference, and everything's a big circle, then progress, the understanding of progress, suffers dramatically. It suffers, because the circle's the same. What part of the circle you're at is completely irrelevant. It's just going to go back again, over and over. Best thing you can do, maybe, is count the cycles. But your understanding of progress suffers dramatically when you, when you embrace a cyclical idea of time. If it's linear, progress uh, becomes bountiful. You have an understanding of progress because you have a beginning and an end. And they're not the same. There was a very large cobra floating along the ocean. And, and most of these stories, come, man came from animals. That's, that's what most of them came from. The, the man comes from the creation. The creation gives birth to mankind. That's what most of them are. It's usually an animal. Sometimes it's a pea pod. And sometimes, uh, sometimes it's light. just came from this nebulous idea of light. There was a very large cobra floating along the ocean. Just hanging out, floating in the ocean. Within its coils was a sleeping Vishnu. Suddenly a lotus begins growing from Vishnu's navel. When the lotus blooms, it is revealed that Brahma, a four-headed demigod, is contained inside. Brahma decides he needs to create and, meditate on, and meditates on this for eons. Brahma decides to split the lotus into three separate portions. One part of the lotus becomes the heavens, the second piece of the lotus becomes the sky, and the third part of the lotus becomes the earth. He creates birds, fish, trees, plants, humans, and other animals to reside on the earth. In Hinduism, it is taught that this is not the first universe, nor is it the last. Perfect for a Marvel movie. Lord Vishnu births the universe from the lotus. Oh, I'm sorry. There are three deities, Lord Vishnu, Lord Brahma, and Lord Shiva. Each specializes in different aspects of creation. Lord Vishnu, Vishnu births the universe from the lotus. Lord Brahma creates universe and everything in it. And Lord Shiva destroys the universe so that it can be recreated. See? It's just, I mean, what are we working towards? It's just going to get destroyed anyway. 
These three deities are all integral parts of the creation story and are all are parts of one whole, the supreme one. Let's, you know, just, just for kicks, let's, let's go into their idea of the creation story. Number five. Number five on the list. The Genesis creation story casts out Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden after Eve ate from the tree of knowledge. One of the most well-known creation stories belongs to the, both Judaic and Christian faiths. The creation story is told in the book of Genesis details the seven-day process. On the first day, God created light and the universe. On the second day, the sky and the waters were made. On the third day, God created land and vegetation. On the fourth day, the sun, the moon, the stars were made to fill the skies. On the fifth day, both sea and land creatures were born. On the sixth day, man was created, Adam and Eve. The seventh day, God rested. The paradise of Eden was designated as the perfect land for Adam and Eve. All food was provided them. There was no death, no pain, and no suffering. There was only one rule. They were not to eat from the tree of knowledge. However, Eve was tempted by a serpent, and I disagree with that. There only being one rule. However, Eve was tempted by a serpent in the garden, persuading her to eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge. When she ate uh, the fruit from the tree, God cast them out of Eden. They would suffer the consequences of sin, pain, and death. Okay? Not the worst summary I've ever heard. There was more than one rule. The first rule being you shall not eat of it, the tree. Second rule being be fruitful and multiply. That was a rule. God told them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. I've given you all things. Go. That's the second rule. Purpose. Purpose in mankind. Right away. Here you are. Welcome to the garden. Here's what you're doing. God destroys the earth. Resets. The great reset. Family comes out. Here's your purpose. Worship me and enjoy me forever? Nope. Didn't say that. Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue the earth and fill it. That's your original purpose here on this earth. You're either helping that or you're at war with it. I'll talk about that more when we talk about the uh, theology of work um, in, in the uh, next time I come here to uh, teach. Celtic mythology states that Ioka, a white mare, I'm sorry to all my Celtic friends out there, I know I'm saying that wrong. Celtic is just as bad as French is not pronouncing and mispronouncing the letters and words and a white mare became pregnant with the first god, Kernunos, after eating berries. Again, it goes man from animals. We have animals that give birth to man. Okay? It was said that the Ioka's birth was so painful she ripped off bark from a nearby oak tree and cast the bark into the ocean. This created the giants of the deep. However, upon seeing all the beasts now in the ocean, Kernunos became very lonely. He decided to make Ioka pregnant again, and the following births resulted in the creation of the gods and the goddesses. Uh, yada, 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 yada. <sighs> Another characteristic of these creation myths is that the actual God is about two or three steps removed from mankind. God creates a being. This being creates something else. That being creates humans, and it's usually by accident. And they're usually surprised. So, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what's this? What do we have here? Humans. Okay, cool. Let's keep going. The reason I'm reading these to you is because every last one of them sacrifices the purpose of mankind here on earth. The value of mankind. God has created us in his image. Whoever sheds man's blood, so um, uh, by man shall his blood be shed. We have value. They're completely irrelevant to what we're trying to do here on earth. Completely irrelevant. If, I, if I've never heard any of those creation stories, I just keep on living life. And the practicality of it. How do, I, how do I use this in life? How do I take this and apply it to my surroundings? We're all born of a raven. Yeah, so what? What's right? What's wrong? Says who? The raven? I, I'm, I'm three or four steps removed from whatever God made that raven. I can't ex access him. Completely irrelevant to what I'm doing. We worship a creator God who is actively involved in the creation uh, of the world and his people even today. He didn't just do it and step back 
He's still involved right now. Praise the Lord. Turn with me to Psalm 104. Let's look at this creator God and how he views his creation. A lot of the creation stories I read from the 16 incredible creation stories from around the world, the gods are confused, the gods are sad, the gods are angry. Confused is actually one that shows up a lot. Bad things happen, the gods start crying, and that's some stories that made humans from tears. But again, those, those tears were several times removed from the actual big god up there, whoever that was. Psalm 104, bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God. Verse 1, sorry, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose. The valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so they may not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valley. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode... You water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock, the plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness, and it is night, when all the beasts of the field creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships, and Leviathan, which you have formed to play in it. These all look to you. See that? These all look to you. This is not a God whose several gods were moved away from us. These all, including the grass, including the ships, And the grass, these all look to you. The wind. To give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. No other religion can make the statements that are made in here, in that chapter. Man could not have written this. We all see what man writes. We all see man creating an Im- creating a God who is less than himself. Less than himself. Every single time. Show me a creation story that is not Christian and I will show you a God who is beneath me. A God that I can afford to ignore. Who cares? Unless those religions actively stole from Christianity, which many of them now do, many of the new ones. This is a God who is active in his creation. 
a creator God who makes it and it says, this is good. And then he makes us and says, it's very good. This is different from all of the other man-made religions in the world. The claims that it makes, the application that we see. Now, I read to you a verse from Psalm 115. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. If you make a stupid God, you become stupid. There's no, there's no getting around. There's no two ways about it. If you worship a wise God, you become wise. Turn with me to Isaiah 58.12. I'm going to start at uh, Isaiah 58. I'm going to start at verse 8. Isaiah 58, and with special attention to uh, verse 12. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and to satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fall. Here's verse 12. I'm going to read it from the King James Version because I believe that's a more accurate translation of this. I'm reading from the ESV, but I'll read this verse from uh, King James Version. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. We worship a creator God, therefore we create. We worship a wise God, therefore we become wise. We have the mind of Christ that is easily accessible to us. This is the mind of Christ. Verse 12, and they that shall be of thee shall build. My question for you today, are you building? Are you separating the building of Christ's kingdom into good and bad? And what I mean by that is, are you separating the men of the cloth and the men of the plow? saying this is good and this one's bad. That was something that we needed to reform back in, the, you know, back in Martin Luther's time, that people were saying, this is, this is creeping back in. It's coming back in with pietism and Gnosticism. Ooh, atoms, molecules, ah, bad. Spiritual, light, heavenless, good. It's creeping back in that the pastors and the clergymen, if you really want to serve the Lord, you'll become a pastor. If you really want to serve the Lord, you'll stop being so greedy about feeding your family. That's, that's bad. Physical, atoms, bad. I'm not joking you. This is creeping back in. Right? Because in our churches, we don't, pra we don't praise the men of the plow, do we? We don't see the farmer out there in his field. We don't see the store clerk getting paid minimum wage in the Sunoco as saying that is a beautiful, wonderful thing. We don't. Either you're building Christ's kingdom, and I'm telling you that something right now, I, 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 I'm ready to die on this hill. That store clerk who's sitting on his fat butt making minimum wage at the Sunoco is furthering the kingdom of Christ, if he is a believer, just as much as the guy bushwhacking through the jungle. We are builders because we worship a building God. We are creators because we worship a creating God. There are two types of Christians, those who maintain and those who build. And one is just as good as the other. The woman who stays at home and takes care of the house, her calling and profession is just as noble as the man who's out there bushwhacking through the jungle or the guy who's out there uh, working 80 hours a week. It's just as noble. Do not separate the two. God is a builder. God is a creator. God is a sustainer. 
And anytime you find yourself doing one of those three things, it is honorable and it is good. Do not separate the men of the cloth from the men of the plow. We worship a creator God who is actively involved in his creation. Even now, it is good, it is holy, it is just. And because he is a creator, we turn around also and create. Let's pray.